today on Straight Talk Africa, a candid conversation on some efforts to fight corruption and graft in Africa. That discussion is coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America headquarters here in Washington. I am Shaka Sali, and today we are talking about corruption in Africa. Transparency International has released a new global corruption index that tracks perceptions of corruption in 180 countries. The report reveals that the performance of countries in sub-Saharan Africa paints a bleak picture of inaction against corruption. My colleague Paul Ndiho has more on the story. As world leaders are gathered with billionaire executives at the recent concluded economic forum in Davos, Switzerland, tens of thousands of people demonstrated in cities around the world demanding that action be taken to tackle growing inequality and corruption. A new report released by Transparency International highlights the scale of the problem. The annual Corruption Perception Index states that are winning the fight against corruption continues to be an uphill battle for sub-Saharan African nations. With a score of 66, the Seychelles under the highest mark in the region, followed by Botswana at 61, Cape Verde 58, Rwanda 53, and Mauritius 52. Not surprising are the countries that are at the bottom of the index. Somalia 9, South Sudan 12, Sudan 16, and Equatorial Guinea at 16 as well. A majority of citizens are surveyed in more than 35 African countries think that corruption is getting worse and that their government is doing a poor job of fighting the vice. Those people with a lot of wealth, they also have access to power, privilege, influence of our democracy and how we live our lives today. Angola is waging a fight in its battle against corruption. The nation's judiciary is investigating billionaire Isabel Dos Santos over alleged mismanagement and misappropriation of funds. While she was chairwoman of the state oil firm Sonongo, her bank accounts and assets in her home country have been frozen and the nation's chief prosecutor says authorities could issue an international arrest warrant if she fails to cooperate in a corruption probe in which she has been named as a suspect. Ms. Dos Santos denies any wrongdoing and says the allegations are politically motivated. Well, the allegations are, are false. Um, unfortunately, we were not given the opportunity to present our evidence or to defend ourselves. We were not aware of any such proceedings. Um, we were not summoned. We never received any notices. I've never received a summons. My directors never received any summons or notices. So these proceedings were very much held in secrecy. We don't know exactly what are the accusations. But from what we've heard so far, um, we can say that the, you know, the allegations are false allegations. Isabel Dos Santos' father, Jose Eduardo Dos Santos, ruled the oil-rich but impoverished the country for nearly 40 years. The International Consortium of Investigative Journalists obtained more than 715,000 documents pertaining to Isabel Dos Santos. Stalking flesh claims that she siphoned off hundreds of millions of dollars in public money. There's still a lot of stuff to come up, and I hope that it does, because Isabel is not the only one who's guilty. In a separate investigation, the anti-corruption NGO Global Witness has discovered the apparent theft of more than $50 million in public funds from the Republic of Congo by Dennis Kiki Sasongweso, the son of the current president, Dennis Sasongweso. The report alleges that he laundered millions through six European countries. Kiki Sasongweso is denying all allegations of wrongdoing. Meanwhile, Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta has made fighting graft his number one issue, but critics say he has been slow to pursue top officials. No high-profile convictions have occurred since he took office. Widespread corruption continues to hinder development and disproportionately affects Africa's poorest citizens, who many times have to pay bribes to access public services. Paul Liho, VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that interesting report. Joining us here in the studio 
are two distinguished guests. Salem Solomon, multimedia journalist with the Voice of America, Joao Santa Rita, international broadcaster with VOA Portuguese service, and from the German capital of Berlin, we are joined live via Skype by Paul Banova, regional advisor for Africa at the Transparency International. Well, I have to say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the three of you on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure. Yeah, you're most welcome. Thank you, Shaka. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for joining us all the way from Berlin. Of course, uh, we are in, in 1884, Africa was divided into so many countries that in some cases divided the families. How do you feel like uh, living in Berlin? Uh, thank you so much, Shaka, and uh, it's a pleasure having us on the show. Uh, indeed, as you point out, uh, there is a lot of history uh, connected uh, with Berlin. Living in Berlin today is uh, a fundamentally different, but it's a good blend of the history, looking into the history and looking at the strides Germany itself has made, uh, what we have to learn from those uh, strides. Uh, it's interesting living here. Very good, very good. Now, if you were to talk to us from the deepest, better part of the bottom of your Berlin heart and soul, how credible, how independent is Transparency International, especially when it is compiling its annual reports? Uh, thank you, Shaka. We, we believe that uh, we are independent, but we also wish to demonstrate that. Uh, and we also wish to demonstrate the credibility. We publish uh, our work, but we also publish the, on the back end uh, all the sources of uh, support that we get to do the work that we do. Uh, we explain uh, our methods in terms of the, the, uh, the way we arrive at what we share with the public. Uh, we communicate uh, from whom the support has come for which specific area of work. And we also com uh, communicate the policies that guide us in uh, doing this work. Uh, our fundraising policy, for example, is quite clear that we will take uh, resources from where we can get them, provided that we are not influenced uh, and our work is not influenced uh, by uh, those sources. How would you characterize uh, the cooperation that you receive from countries in which you operate? And uh, that, uh, Shaka, happens to be very varied. We currently operate in over 100 countries worldwide uh, through uh, country offices that we have in our language, uh, the name national chapters. And uh, it is, the picture is very varied. In, uh, and it also points a little bit to the situation regarding the issue that we are addressing. We have some uh, good cooperation in some countries where it is clear that the state uh, and the various actors are interested, uh, keen, willing to address the common issue that we face, corruption. And uh, we do sometimes face some challenges where the, um, the cooperation and the willingness is not as, as welcoming. So it is a very varied picture. If you were to talk to a lay person who happened to be in the audience. How would you, for example, describe what you mean by an annual corruption perception index? Uh, so for the corruption perception index, we, we try to assess the level of corruption in uh, the public sector in a country and compare this across the world. Uh, what we do, as um, uh, Paul uh, shared before in, uh, in the brief that we had, is to present this in terms of percentages. 
and 100% uh, would indicate a country that has uh, very good systems to, pre to prevent corruption. And uh, it would mean that uh, it would range from recruitment systems in the public sector, uh, declarations of wealth and income assets for public officials when they enter office, uh, public education, all measures to prevent corruption uh, and uh, where they are highly efficient. Um, and also, should that uh, have uh, any corruption seep through, the same state has very good measures to combat corruption. And that would mean good investigations, uh, good prosecution, sanctions. So where such systems are functioning super efficiently, uh, we would uh, rate that as 100%. Uh, so far, we do not have any such country scoring 100%. Uh, as Paul shared, uh, for the 2019 index, uh, at the highest level, we have 87% a position shared by Denmark and New Zealand, and that is an entire 13 percentage points away from the perfect situation I was just describing for, for the measure of corruption. I was looking at, uh, you know, the uh, annual report, and um, Africa does not look good at all. Any particular reason why Africa seems to be lagging behind in fighting corruption and graft? Uh, <clears throat> I think w one, uh, one quick explanation for what you've called the lay person in the audience, uh, that would be myself, would be that uh, these systems, the perfect situation I, de I described, the uh, very efficient systems to prevent corruption and where it seeps through, uh, very efficient systems to investigate, prosecute, very good sanctions. Those systems are not at the level where they would address the problem appropriately in a number of our uh, situation uh, countries in Africa. The average uh, for, for Africa, which Paul may not have mentioned, is 32. 32% is the average for 2019. Uh, it was also 32% in 2018 as well as the year before, 31% uh, in 2016. So it's been uh, stagnating at 30s for quite a while now, indicating that our systems uh, do still have a long way to go. What are some of the countries that uh, have had some improvement in terms of fighting the scourge? And why did they improve? What exactly did they do that the other countries need to learn from? Uh, thank you. The, <clears throat> before even getting into that, Shaka, the, it is important to caveat to, to, to mention that um, uh, corruption as a, a challenge in a society is very context specific. And therefore, anti corruption is also sometimes um, and it needs to be to take that into account. Um, but there are some measures that have been uh, cutting across, especially what we are now putting together in international frameworks, uh, that um, it would be good to have uh, an anti-corruption system that is coordinated in an anti-corruption agency. This anti-corruption agency needs to be resourced uh, and well-resourced. It needs to have the independence uh, to do its job. Uh, it needs to be established in a law. So there are, there are such measures. But uh, it is also true that there are places where we, countries, uh, where we have these uh, systems in place and the laws also are in place. Institutions are many, but this, the situation remains uh, difficult uh, and the scores remain low. So it is very context specific, but if I'm to pick some of the high performing countries in Africa, uh, relatively, uh, and these are again, I'll pick from what Paul mentioned, that uh, we have at the top of the African uh, section, uh, Seychelles at 66%, uh, which is followed by Botswana at 61%. There are some lessons to pick from there. Uh, Botswana has for a long time had what we've categorized as um, um, mainstreaming uh, corruption. In, in uh, all institutions, public institutions in Botswana, you will find uh, an entity that is addressing corruption, and then that is coordinated centrally. 
uh, in a way uh, similar to how we tackled other challenges like HIV, ensuring that every section of the, the public sector has uh, attention to this problem. So there are some um, such examples, but maybe uh, a last one I'll mention is that without very clear leadership uh, and uh, very clear political will uh, from the leadership, uh, any measures put in place uh, struggle, uh, sometimes even fail. So political will um, to, to address corruption remains one of the key success factors. And this is shared where we have countries that are relatively performing better. Very interesting. Let me ask you uh, one more question before I come to uh, my guests here in the Washington studios. In a very simple uh, lay person's language, what is corruption? So we have adopted uh, a definition that is very wide. We say corruption is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. And it has those two elements. There is the abuse of power, and it is for private gain. And uh, the, it, that wide definition embraces a number of practices. Uh, and uh, some of them will involve uh, monetary uh, transactions, like bribe paying, uh, bribe giving. Uh, some may not, uh, like um, uh, favoritism, uh, favoring one individual because of a kinship, a relationship, to take up an office that they may not deserve, uh, even where there's no monetary transaction. So the practices um, will uh, range um, in all sectors, and uh, we, it would be just good to give uh, various examples. These are some of the basic ones uh, that we could share. What about uh, electoral fraud or election rigging? Would you consider that to be an aspect of corruption? Uh, yes, for as long as uh, it would fit um, in uh, abusing an office for uh, private gain, it would uh, fit the definition of corruption. And the examples within the uh, political uh, electoral um, uh, section would also be varied uh, if we had a, a public officer, let's say in an electoral commission, accepting um, uh, some compensation to uh, either prevent a candidate, uh, an undesired candidate from uh, accessing what they should access or favoring one that should access what they shouldn't, um, that would also come under corruption. And uh, the challenge with the election specifically is that it is abusing uh, a system that we all depend on. Uh, it is the right of the citizen to, to elect their leader, to choose their leader. And once that is subverted, it then uh, it, it changes the entire state um, with respect to what the citizens would have desired. And that is stolen away from them. Salem, what about you? Uh, do you agree with his definition of corruption? Well, corruption um, is broad, as he uh, laid it out. It could happen in different institutions. But I think uh, what I would like to stress on is the fact that corruption has a corrosive effect in different institutions. What do you mean by corrosive effect? Because there are people who may not access that adjective. So what I mean by that is, uh, say, for instance, when you see you know, elites and political elites uh, abusing their power, be it money or other uh, opportunities that they have, um, for the average person, mm. or for um, someone, a cop um, um, you know, doing his beat, or a shopkeeper somewhere, or villagers in rural places, if, that, if they see that, what that means to them is that success only can come through these, through cutting corners. And so it really has a trickling down effect on uh, when institutions or people who are on top of institutions uh, abuse either their power or money or military 
or business, all these opportunities and, and, and privileges that they have, mm. um, what does it mean for the average person who has to deal with everyday life? So it sends a really corrosive, meaning negative um, effect for the average person who sees success through, through these eyes of the elites use, misusing negative their power. impact. What about you, uh, Joao? Oh, I totally agree. And uh, from what your guest was saying from Berlin, uh, this thing about giving favoritism to certain people, it's what I, I find it very interesting because it's what the Angolan uh, investigator and journalist Rafael Marx, he described it as transparent, transparent corruption. And what is transparent corruption is exactly what has happened with Isabel dos Santos. That is, Isabel dos Santos was given, it's alleged, <laughs> is given businesses that were financed by the state. The state financed the companies, gave her money to form companies. Some of, of them went bankrupt, and some of this money was never paid. For, for, example, for example? For example, today we have the example of the jewelry company that was financed uh, in part by the Angolan diamond companies, so, uh, so, uh, Sodium. Sodium gave $200 million for Isabel dos Santos for, to form a company to, to buy this jewelry company. Now, this company has just gone bankrupt. The Swiss just announced that. So Sodium has lost $200 million in a business. Now, this is what is transparent corruption, because as Isabel dos Santos' husband told our colleague here in mm. an interview, mm. he said, well, this might be illegal in the United States. Mm. This might be illegal in Europe. It's not illegal in Angola, in Angola for the state to give money for somebody to open a company. Okay, so there you are. That's the favoritism that your guest mm -hmm. talked from, from, um, from Berlin. And I bet if I had gone to Sodium or you or her or him and asked for $200 million to form a company, they wouldn't give it to you. And what about uh, Sonongol? Well, Sonongol, you have the same thing. Sonongol, according to the documents, gave money to uh, Isabel dos Santos and her husband to form a company in Portugal to buy shares in an Angolan oil company. Now, what she says, and she might be right in this, is that in this case, actually, this company is making a lot of money. But the problem here is not this, is that why did she get this money? From, because the, the father who was president said, you can order Sonangol to, gain, to give this money to her to form a company to invest in a Portuguese oil company. And this, again, it's this case of favoritism and transparent corruption. Now, the state alleges that they were never paid this money. Isabel de Santos said they tried to pay it, to pay it, and now there is a dispute because uh, the state government, the state says that they tried to pay it in local money, Kwanzas, but they want to be paid back in dollars because that's what uh, the loan was given to. It was in dollars. So, uh, but this is a very case of transparent corruption. Now, of course, as she was saying, in Angola, you know, the circles of corruption go all the way down. The Angolans have a, a word called uh, gazosa. Gazosa is a fizzy drink. Mm -hmm. You know, everywhere you go, they ask you for gazosa. From the cops to everywhere you go, what's the gazosa? You know, what are you going to pay? So this, this is the corrosive aspect of corruption in Angola that, you know, it worked in circles. You have the president and the circle around him, which is his family, which then has circles, sub-circles, and it goes all the way down to the basic level. But uh, Joao, in fairness to Isabel dos, dos Santos, um, she says that uh, she actually found Sonangor on the verge of collapse. Yeah, well. That she is the one, in fact, that revived it. Well, well she <laughs> that? She, uh, yeah, she says that, and there's no doubt that Sonangor was on the verge of corruption, I mean, the, on the verge of bankruptcy. They were in a very bad state. I don't know how, how close they were to, corruption, uh, to bankruptcy. And that was because there was corruption before she got there, okay? But now, you know, she gets there, and Sonangol gives money for her to open a company to invest in, in, in Portugal. You know, it's just not right, you know? It's, it's, it's like everybody looks at that and says, well, she's giving, getting this money because she, she's the daughter of the president, you know. Now, I don't know about the accounts of Sonangol, 
The guy who replaced her says that that is not true, that the company was in a worse position. And then what happened in her case too, the documents allege, she had companies giving uh, co uh, consulting work to Sonangol while she was there, and she had interests in these companies. Now, the only thing that she faces a, a very big criminal problem as far as now in Angola is because after she was fired, it is alleged, she paid millions of dollars to one of these companies in which she had interests, or at least her friends had interests. Mm -hmm. uh, and she says, well, this was money that was owned by Sonangol because they were doing consulting work for us. But the companies are owned by friends mm. and they were doing consulting for Sonangol. So, look, I don't know how, how what the Sonangol accounts are, but even after she was there, there were many things that were dubious. Uh, can, if I, uh, uh, I want to add a little bit on, on what uh, Joa was saying about, you know, uh, she spoke to us and said that she came in to rescue the the national oil company. company. And I think the, the key thing that she also did during that time when she was assembling international uh, business people. So this has a ripple effect and, and it's, it's become beyond Angola at this point mm -hmm. because she was assembling even companies, uh, consulting and accounting companies from the US, from Europe, and, and all these other countries uh, to come and advise and as a result obviously get paid. So where is the com money coming from? Obviously from the, <laughs> the oil company that is implicated in all of this. So by default, when she's reaching out to international actors, uh, uh, and now we're learning because of a big investigation that came out and that showed all these uh, documents that were signed, court cases uh, now are also shedding a light and there's more to come. But what we're seeing is that it's not just affecting Angola. Now other uh, companies are implicated uh, and all these companies are distancing themselves right now because it implies that they are taking money from uh, that was taken away from average Angolans. Including, so it's become uh, a big a major, a major bank uh, in which she used to be the majority, majority shareholder in Lisbon. Yeah, uh, she, uh, just to correct, she wasn't a majority shareholder. I think she owned about 45%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 40 yeah. something percent. Mm -hmm. uh, well, what's, I think what's concerning for the Angolan authorities, and that's why they froze her accounts in Angola, it's because she has just sold all the shares or is selling all the shares in that bank. There's another bank in which she had the interest, uh, Bank do Fomento de Angola, in which she's also selling the shares. So we don't know where this money is, is going because at the moment, everybody's running away from her, like, as they say in Portuguese, like, uh, you know, from the devil from the cross, you know? So, so uh, but this is very concerning because all this money, we don't know where it's going. And sadly enough, of course, in that bank, we have already a suicide, you know, a manager who committed suicide. Uh, yes. Now, we don't know why he committed suicide, Perhaps we'll never know. Yeah. Do we but, actually know that uh, he committed suicide or he was simply found dead? Well, uh, the police said that he was found dead and there is no reason to suspect anything else. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, he was found dead. He was the manager of her accounts and he committed suicide the, the night of the day in which the Angolan authorities announced that him, Isabel dos Santos, and two other people were now the subject of a criminal investigation, which is the, the step before being indicted. How do we know that, how do we know for sure that uh, someone perhaps uh, did not uh, help him to die? Well, <laughs> that's, you know, I, I just have to go by what the police said. The police said, uh, one interesting thing is that the police also said that he had tried to commit suicide a few days before. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't know, it's very coincidental, I mean, he, he died the day that he was named as a, uh, under a criminal investigation. Uh, and even when he tried to commit suicide, according to the police a few days before, of course, all the scandal had already erupted and the bank was already mentioned as, um, as part of the scandal. Now, again, we don't know why he committed suicide and perhaps we'll never know. 
Well, it, it also goes beyond that because all of these companies now are launching their own investigations. Uh, Pricewater, uh, PwC, uh, Boston Global uh, Consulting here, uh, McKinsey, all these companies that are implicated, 400 plus. I'm talking about this major ones, obviously, but they've started their own internal investigation to see who was involved or who knew and kept quiet. And so we will learn more because it, it has a really big impact and it's not really limited to Angola and so anybody maybe that uh, uh, you know aside from distancing themselves from actually being connected to uh, you know Dos Santos's businesses uh, we're going to hear more about uh, who was involved in ba basically keeping quiet when when money was being embezzled from average Angolans. Again uh, Salim we should point out in fairness to Isabel we should point out that uh, in her defense, she says that uh, she was able to accumulate that wealth, one, because she worked very, very, very hard, and two, she started working very, very early when she was young. Yes, even during uh, the interview that we conducted with her, uh, I, when I was speaking to her, I said, why you you obviously are not really surprised that people would think okay you are the president's daughter and you have all this wealth and her response was i've been everywhere since i was in my 20s and i have businesses i am a business manager i've done this i've done that and there's nothing in our law and angle on law so this institutions and systems supporting basically she's saying that criminalizes what what they were doing meaning taking money from state-owned companies to invest in their own companies and then return it back in local currency and there's a huge discrepancy there and so yes uh, we've heard that from her directly to us when she was speaking to us here at VOA mm. uh, she went on and on about how she said she is the president's daughter and she there's so much light on her that she has made it her business to be transparent is what she said uh, but the the documents show a different story well Unfortunately, time happens not to be our best ally. You are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We will have more of a discussion in a moment. So please, don't go away because we'll be right back with you. Straight Talk Africa streams live every Wednesday on Facebook. You can watch our show there and leave a comment. Now let's look at what's on top for next week's program. On the next Straight Talk Africa, the countries of the Great Lakes region have a turbulent history marked by conflict and political instability at the expense of their citizens human rights in the Great Lakes region on the next Straight Talk Africa. And today we are discussing corruption in Africa with Salim Solomon, VOA multimedia journalist, Joao Saltarita, international broadcaster with VOA Portuguese service, and from the German capital of Berlin, we are joined live via Skype by Paul Banoba, Regional Advisor for Africa at the Transparency International. Well, again, I have to say, lady and gentlemen, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the three of you on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. Great to be here. You're most welcome. You're most welcome. I wanted to ask you uh, one question. Uh, 
Joao, uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, what is going on in the corruption of Angola is what is characterized as transparent corruption. That, uh, that's not my, <laughs> my words, it's the words of an Angolan, but yeah. How different is this from what obtained in South Africa under the Jacobo Zuma presidency called state capture? We're talking about the Guptas here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, that, that's uh, that's uh, different, and I'm sure your guest from Berlin can can make the difference better than I am. Because that, what I think you have, is direct bribery by a family, an Indian family, the Gupta family, on members of the government uh, for businesses and and uh, and for influence. So there, there's a, a straight bribery there, I think. They were, uh, they were guaranteed, for example, contracts. Exactly. With no competition and exactly. all that kind of stuff. Exactly. In exchange for money yeah. or, or for other monetary favors. So that's the difference. Now, in Angola, I must say, that has also occurred, okay? But at a much lower level uh, uh, in terms of accepting bribes. At the high level of the president, their, their family, the entourage of the president, you have a different kind of corruption. You have perhaps in some cases it's alleged uh, the taking of money from uh, uh, state companies. I remember a couple of years ago the IMF said that they would only need, uh, deal with Angola when they made it transparent. Where did all the money from the oil disappear? And we're talking about billions of dollars over many, many, many years. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a bit different, the bribery and this kind of uh, favoritism what the Angolan Rafael Marx called transparent corruption. But maybe, I don't know. Maybe. Very, very interesting. Uh, let me ask you uh, this question, uh, uh, Paul. Yes. You obviously have been following the discussion. What about uh, the comparison between uh, transparency, corruption, and state capture as practiced in South Africa during the Jacobo uh, Zuma presidency. Uh, thank you, Shaka. In terms of uh, transparent corruption, I, I am actually finding the term very interesting. <laughs> it would be, it would perhaps make for, for a bit more further discussion. But I suppose what um, the, the common term that has uh, perhaps prevailed before transparent corruption is the, the idea of impunity. Mm. That, uh, yes, this is being done in full view, and that is the transparent aspect. This is being done in full view, but we don't care. We can get away with it, and, and uh, you can say what you want, but we have our own explanations, and we can go forward. So I suppose impunity um, uh, as, as a term a bit more established might, be, might encompass this uh, transparent aspect that, uh, that, that is now coming up with the transparent corruption. And uh, it's also an expression of the frustration of those who wish to see a different situation. And they see uh, the idea that resources of a state uh, are not serving the society, they're not serving citizens who badly need them, and instead are catering to the, a very small elite group and who are perhaps using it in very luxurious ways and in full view, full glare of the public and still getting away with it. Uh, so I, I suppose that is where this new uh, idea uh, comes in. In the fairness to Angora, I think we must point out that uh, this practice is not really limited to Angola when it comes to Africa. You can find it in many, many countries across the continent and especially those countries which attained independence or those countries in which parties secured power through liberation struggles uh, and you have some individuals ruling for a very long time. In the, in the, in the particular case of Angola, you, talk, you have uh, the father of Isabel, uh, a former Angolan president, uh, uh, Jose Eduardo dos Santos, who actually was at the political harem of Angola for 38 years following the death of Dr. Neto. 
Don't you think that there is the tendency that uh, people around the president in that particular context would probably develop a feeling or a sense of entitlement? Is, is that for me, Shaka? Yes, please. I, I, I would agree. I would agree, and um, there, there are two aspects there. The, the manner in which the, the government came into office, but also the length of the time uh, that uh, this government is in office. And uh, this speaks to quite a number of I, uh, what, what you talked about in, uh, in terms of democracy and democratic governance. And uh, the idea that uh, citizens uh, periodically come to to change their leaders so if they do not agree with them and should have the choice uh, if they wish to to uh, re-elect their leaders but the system should also have um, clear limits as to when one can be in office and uh, how much longer uh, they can serve and when they are when they uh, have served that term um, hand over to another government there is a, a health in, in uh, practicing democracy where the citizen remains uh, the ultimate decision maker as to who holds office and, and for how long. Uh, and, and if they're doing not so well, uh, that changes. So yes, there is a, a relationship there. And uh, it also then uh, uh, goes back to what you said before, where systems are subverted by those already in office to keep in office and keep in office longer and there's corruption embedded in that as well. Very interesting. Uh, now, uh, Salem, we of course uh, talk about uh, elections uh, in a lot of African countries, which some pundits, in fact, say would probably be better defined as selections, because apparently there is no political space really for members or political parties or groups which are not in office. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you basically talk about uh, a ruling party that is competing against an opposition whose hands are tied behind their backs and their feet together, who, whose uh, president or leader, for example, selects or chooses, in fact, commissioners who sit on an electoral commission, and therefore, eventually, an election whose results do not reflect the will of the voter or the will of the people, but rather the will of the individual who announces the results or the will of the individuals who count the votes. Mm -hmm. not, not taking the consent of the people, yes. as it's supposed to be. Yes. It's a contract with people. Isn't that uh, <laughs> the mother of all corruption? <laughs> That's a very, very good point. And also, I, I wanted to mention, uh, not to go back to Angola, but uh, Rafael in his thesis, uh, the journalist that exposed corruption in Angola, calls it transparency, transparency. of looting. <laughs> yes. That's the term used, looting. So the thing is, when you have systems already in your favor. You do it, you do it in, his, in their face. Yeah, and, 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 and the people in power right now also were under Mr. Uh, jo, uh, 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 Dos Santos himself. You are not accountable yeah. to anybody, really. So going back to the election uh, rigging and the fact that uh, some governments don't mind having some sort of, sort of contract with the people, working for the people holding public office. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the tie, mon not just monetary, but the tie uh, between democratic elections is that there are principles that are embedded in these. Transparency. You have to declare your money. You have to have some sort of accountability. And there are no legal systems. So if you dismantle legal institutions, that hold someone accountable when they, uh, you know, try to cut corners or skim money from the top or bribe, uh, you know, people to influence either the way uh, something, the outcomes uh, changes in their favor. Um, we have so many examples to think about beyond Angola, unfortunately, and it's not just Africa. Corruption is, is a principal thing. It's uh, a and so, thing. yeah, it's, it's not a geographic it's issue. Universal. It's a principal, it is not yeah, checked. broad issue. And we can bring up examples for instance, even in Ethiopia, for instance, in East Africa, uh, where the new leadership came in, and now uh, most of the economic spots were held by one party. Mm. And so uh, now that they're cracking down on corruption, we can bring up Kenya as, an, as an, another example where 
blatant, so, abrasive, uh, you know, corruption cases that we can uh, talk about. But yeah. Uh, so, so I'm afraid uh, to inform you that uh, there is no democracy in Studio 47. <laughs> when the producer says you have to go, you have to go. I gather that uh, we do, in fact, have uh, a caller. Uh, so they're asking me to go to the lifeline of the show, which is the telephone callers. Tedra from Ethiopia. Tedra, is it good evening or is it good afternoon? Tedra, can you hear me? Hey, Shaka. Yes, we please. Know we have been discussing about uh, corruption in Africa, but where the Western financial institution? The Western financial institution is also part of the problem. They know all this corrupted money coming to Wall Street or in London or whatever you call it, and they, they are keeping quiet. They are participating. They are part of the problem. Let me tell you, when you come, come to New York, wherever you go, people asking you, do you have money? If you have $10,000 or you declare it, that is your money. Otherwise, after 9-11, all terrorist money, they know they're tracking it down. And if you come in, New York, in Boston, you buy a real estate, pay in cash, Nobody asking you. You want to buy a property? Three million? An African guy can come in. They never ask you. Tedra, Tedra, do you have a question, please? Yeah, my question is, where, where, where is the role of Western financial institutions who give us a loan, but they don't care where, whether that is loan is illegally come back to Western countries? Where is the system? Where is the mechanism for checking up? They give us a loan, the loan is coming back to their bank legally. Thank you very much. Uh, you, would you like to respond uh, yeah, to that? Uh, look, uh, I think, and your guest will also, I think, will agree with me. In the last few years, there's been a tightening of control of the banks. And you can see that in the Isabel dos Santos. The dos Santos family was having enormous problems in opening accounts with banks. Mm. Now, you, 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 your caller is very right in so this. So they decided to buy the banks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. Yeah. If, you, if you want to loan the money, you don't have the money, you buy a bank. But, but you know, there's been a tightening of that, I must say. But your caller is very right. I mean, uh, this requires an international approach because, I mean, we get it in New York where you go to these luxury condos in buildings recently built are empty. And all the condos have been bought by who? Foreigners, we don't know where the money comes from. Mm. So um, there is a problem there, for sure, it's sure. I, I just wanted to add something that, that you mentioned uh, previously about um, you know, power in Africa. And I think uh, now with the hindsight of history, mm -hmm. we can look back. And the mistake that uh, we Africans made is that we looked at liberation movements and leaders after independence thinking that their default condition mm. was democracy and transparency. Mm. And it wasn't. Mm. You know, that's why now I, I always have, I, I, I try to be careful. I, I we, say, we probably thought that uh, their leaders were altruistic. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's human nature. <laughs> and, and so. It is human nature, that is why we need checks and balances. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And this is the institutional uh, aspect of it. You have to have strong institutions to combat this, and, and not only in Africa, but around the world. Mm. Mm. There is a legal system, for, for example, if Americans uh, want to do business with African uh, countries or companies, mm. it's called the Foreign Corruption Act. Mm. American citizens, by law, have to go through certain prerequisites to make sure that they protect themselves from corruption. Right. Uh, but there, are, there and, aren't uh, international and laws. And to what extent are those laws, uh, those laws enforced? They have been effective, especially for American citizens. Mm. But for foreigners, when the other way around happens, mm. uh, now new laws are being written so that it's easier to at least flag, like the Magnitsky Act is a new law that has been implemented in places like, uh, you know, including uh, uh, Russian oligarchs, uh, the Gambian president, Yaya Jame. Now he's been accused of embezzling a lot of millions of dollars. Uh, and, and so this act has been sanction, you know, sanctioning them immediately or flagging businesses for, to mm. not do businesses. Mm. Uh, business with with these uh, corrupt uh, individuals or institutions uh, these kind of international legal uh, institutions will probably moving forward um, help root out corruption very interesting uh, Paul are you there I am here 
Checker. What about uh, offshore, uh, for example, uh, you know, banking? And what about, uh, you know, when we talk about, uh, for example, the Swiss banks and those types of things, uh, we have had a lot of uh, African political elite who basically have uh, stolen money from their people, from their countries, and uh, kept that money in some of these countries. What about those countries? Uh, we see them, for example, uh, on Transparency International annual reports. Uh, they don't seem to be doing very badly when it comes to corruption. But they seem to be safe. I don't see, for example, Switzerland, um, you know, looking bad. Uh, and, and it's a very important observation. Um, the uh, a number of institutions are looking at um, trying to assess how much of African resources are leaving the continent illicitly, and uh, where are they winding up. And uh, the uh, Global Financial Integrity has given us some figures. Very recently, the uh, African Union, in an effort with the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, put that figure at uh, 50 to 60 billion annually. That Jeez. Africa loses 50 to 60 billion dollars annually to uh, illicit, through illicit financial flows, and also tried to map uh, the roots. Where are the the biggest uh, resources coming from, which countries, through which routes, via which um, uh, uh, other countries, and uh, winding up where. So we have some studies on this, mm -hmm. and indeed a question can be asked, for those um, countries where these resources wind up, should they be uh, scored uh, as, um, as they are being scored? And indeed we get into this debate uh, quite a bit. So I'll just point out that uh, for this particular index that uh, uh, was shared at the beginning, the Corruption Perceptions Index, we are looking at uh, just one uh, area, the public uh, institutions, uh, the public sector. So this is a perception of corruption in the public sectors in these countries, and it's uh, specifically looking at uh, what is uh, compiled from uh, these 13 sources that have already collected the data uh, Africa Development Bank, World Bank, and, and a few others. So we would need to look into a slightly different direction to, to then assess uh, the contributions of uh, these other states where the uh, resources wind up and what measures can be done. A uh, number of conversations are going on with regard to uh, tracing the assets uh, that have left, for example, Africa illicitly, uh, or which we are now calling stolen assets. Uh, where they are, uh, can they be frozen where they are, and can they be returned to the um, uh, where they were meant to be in the first place? So those conversations are also uh, happening, and uh, they they are they, they are equally important. Very interesting, uh, uh, Salim. What about, uh, uh, for example, healthcare? Hmm. When you do some research. Uh, you find that um, a lot of countries on the African continent, uh, they really don't do well when it comes to the issue of health care. And therefore, the political elite in those countries and their families and their friends, they use the taxpayers' money to go for medical checkups in Europe, in India, in North America, and some of the, some, some actually go to South Africa. And ironically, when they go to places like South Africa, they go to places like the United Kingdom, and uh, they go to come to places like North America, sometimes they end up, in fact, being treated by their own sons and daughters. That is true. Who have run, since run away <laughs> for greener pastures, so to yeah. speak. And yet, the ordinary citizen cannot even have access to penicillin. Hmm. Not only that, they have to even deal with counterfeit uh, medicine yes. that comes that through. That is expired. Yeah, and that you don't even know if they're getting the right kind of medication. What but, about that type of corruption? What so, about education? Yeah, it's, you find, it's all these example, institutions that... That the children of the political elite 
they do not have confidence in their own educational institutions. That's right. They send their children again to go to study in Europe, North America, go to South Africa, to India and what have you, but the ordinary, the, the, folk, the, the children of the ordinary folks are given through service delivery what is called uh, free primary education, which does not have really uh, anything to go by. You find that uh, they go through uh, so-called free secondary education where they do not really learn anything that can be helpful. Yeah, not what up to par to international precisely. standards as well. They do, their children do not go to their own local universities. That's right. Because they do not have confidence in their own universities. So two institutions that you mentioned, I mean, as, as uh, uh, earlier described, corruption is very broad, it touches yes. so many institutions. Yes. Healthcare is a key issue. Yes. All these leaders, um, you can mention Nigeria, Mohamed Buhari always goes to London to get his uh, health, uh, uh, you know, checked. Yes. Uh, and who pays for that? The average Nigerian. It's not that, uh, <laughs> we, it's not that really some of these individuals should not have the opportunity to go abroad or overseas for medical treatment or attention if it is required really. That's right. But not some kind of routine. That's the key. You I have think had the... situations, for example, where a president sent in a presidential jet his daughter to give delivery when she was not even sick. Yeah, I mean, so many cases we can think of. Uh, Muhammadu Buhari going to London for, I mean, when it's needed, it's one thing. But uh, we have to go back to ask, are, what kind of message are they sending to the average people too? Are the health institutions not good in their own country? This is a top leader going to other countries to seek uh, medical attention. Cameroon is another example where yeah. they would go to European countries and rent out hotels mm. for extended amount of time. Even the people who care for them have nicknames for them. So. And so we have so many examples of people at the top of the, the country, at the power, using, um, you know, public money and public office for their own uh, benefits. So, Joel, how can this uh, be prevented? How can people, uh, how can they organize, mobilize, and make well, sure this does not happen on their watch? I think that... In the, the, Kenya, the, yeah. they have tried to bring what they characterize as lifestyle audit. Well, that's very good, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's very good. Uh, I think, yeah. Civil society is going to have to play a very important role in this, and international pressure. And I think uh, the, the, good, the good sign is that there are, in a number of countries, uh, uh, the appearance uh, and the strengthening of civil society organizations, which slowly but surely are pressuring mm. for this. And I think that's a good sign. That's happening in Angola. That's happening in Mozambique. I believe that's happening in Kenya. And of course, international organizations like Transparency International right. are very, very important because their work gets publicized uh, for better or for worse, and this creates pressure. So I think it's a slow movement. Uh, I just wanted to end about this, the right. doctors and the immigration from uh, Africa. President Dos Santos... Unfortunately, okay. time happens not to be a best ally. On that note, our guests today were Salem Solomon, Sao Jao Santa Rita and Paul Banoba. Thanks to our audience for tuning into Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better Africa. And please, please remember to keep the African hope alive.